from Bear Pond Books. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Vermont College of Fine Arts for co-hosting this event tonight and giving us this beautiful space. Uh, good time to remind you to turn off your phones or at least turn the volume off. Um, and we're very excited to be celebrating Senator Leahy, his career, and his new book, The Road Taken. The program this evening is going to be interview style. We have Garrett Graff who's going to be interviewing the Senator. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A and a book signing. We also have pre-signed books available um, if you don't want to wait in the line. Um, but I would suggest getting in with the Senator. Um, so that, and restrooms are right out here and I'm sure you've all found the elevator by now. So, uh, Garrett Graff, Graff, Garrett Graff, excuse me, is a historian, journalist, and author. You've seen him on CNN. Uh, you know him through his books, Raven Rock, The Only Plane in the Sky, and most recently, Watergate, A New History. Interesting stuff in there. Um, but most notably, he's a Montpelier native, <laughs> which we love, and um, Garrett uh, has been proving his political chops for a long time. He was a Senate page in high school for none other than another Montpelier native, Senator Leahy. <laughs> and we're coming full circle here tonight, so we love that. Real local action. Excuse me. Uh, Senator Leahy, our senior senator, our longest serving senator, he's in his eighth term. He is the Senate President Pro Tem. He is the chair of the Appropriations Committee and has been chair of too many committees to list here tonight. He is a supporter of human rights. Uh, education, the arts, and the environment, and above all, he is a supporter of Vermont. He has been working tirelessly for us for 48 years. Amazing. <laughs> But as we know, he's not all politics. Uh, our senator is well known for his love of photography. He's taken a few star turns in Batman movies. And of course, um, he's well known for his devotion to his wife, Marcel, and family. A well-rounded guy. But enough, enough for me, and uh, we'll let him tell you more about it. Garrett Graff, Garrett Graff, and Senator Leahy. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Um, Senator, it's great to have the chance to talk with you. Um, I, uh, I have to say that the book is great. Um, I'm not being paid to say this. It's a really great uh, history uh, and, and memoir of your extraordinary career. Um, Claire mentioned, you know, eight terms in the U.S. Senate, but it's almost impossible to grasp the full scope of the history that you have lived. Um, you are the third longest serving senator in U.S. history, passing uh, recently your two uh, former colleagues, Strom Thurmond and Ted Kennedy. You have taken the second most number of votes in U.S. Senate history, 17,243 of them as of June. So what I thought we could do today was sort of just go through them one by one. And you could sort of just talk about sort of what you remember of that day. We only need about 280 hours to go through them. So Senate Resolution 21, January 27th, 1975, in the 94th Congress. Take it away. So, <laughs> So um, the thing that sort of just comes through so clearly in this book um, is how much you love the Senate. Um, and, and I thought I would sort of start off by reading a section um, where you sort of talk about it in the introduction, um, that the Senate was an idea. The idea that an institution doesn't belong to a single party or a single ideology nor is it exhibited or embodied in a single issue. The Senate was a concept, an outlook about how we might live or lead, learn or listen. 
And I thought we could just sort of start off by, I could ask you to talk a little bit about how you have come to love the Senate so much uh, in your career and sort of what you have learned about what it says about the way that our government works. Well, that's, that's an excellent question. I don't know, is this, uh, can you hear this okay? Yes. I'm checking over at my two bosses, my wife Marcel and the other, Dr. Carolyn Dwyer, if they're showing me that they can hear me. Uh, before I start, in, in writing this, Garrett, I, I kept an almost daily journal and going back through thousands of pages trying to cipher out. I, I would note that uh, you're a prize winning, top selling author, began as a page at the U.S. Senate before you went on to Harvard and all. And I thought, you know, I, I remember when I pointed you as a page, I thought, gosh, I had to try the same thing as writing a book. It's not easy. I don't know how you do it, but it's not easy going through the notes. But, but back to your, your question. I, as a young law student at Georgetown, I used to go up a lot of times. I had a break between class. Just come to sit in the gallery and watch the Senate, see some of the greats of the time in both parties debate and say this is a place really we should come together, make sure people's voices are heard. And then there's a hundred. Uh, at that time it was a hundred men. Now fortunately it's a hundred men and women representing 325 million Americans. And I wanted that uh, and we had the opportunity to set the conscience. Uh, I realized after I'd been there a while that what I was seeing was some of the best part. I found out there's a lot of other parts in it. But I found it fascinating. Uh, you know, I was offered all kinds of other jobs as we were going along, and including in the judiciary. There was no place I wanted to be other than there in the Senate, especially representing a state like Vermont. I, I grew up just a uh, uh, a few blocks from here, my sister and I, my sister Mary and I, remember walking up this hill, visiting uh, relatives and friends and, and everything. So uh, I, I really became impressed with people who were there, whether I agreed or disagreed an issue. And yes, there has been more votes than. I guess just about all but two. Uh, don't ask me about vote number 14,312. <laughs> we have another idea what uh, But everything about it appealed to me because you could get your own ideas out there. You could try to get other people to join your ideas. You could have an effect on your own state help your own state, but you can also have effect on all other Americans and uh, very much on matters throughout the world. Mm -hmm. it, 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 the book starts off, of, of course, um, you know, with your time growing up in Montpelier and uh, the Leahy Press, uh, an institution that probably almost everyone in this room remembers. Um, it goes on to your time as Chittenden County State's Attorney, and then we come to the race in 1974, um, and one of the most amazing uh, uh, superlatives of your career, uh, to me, has always been that you are the only Democrat ever elected to the U.S. Senate from Vermont, which is a sort of amazing piece of history. And in 1974, uh, as you relate in the book, uh, there are sort of still the pieces of our modern political landscape. You've got Bernie Sanders right there, and then a very young uh, U.S. Senator comes to campaign for you, Joseph Robinette Biden. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the 74 race and, and your memories of Bernie and President Biden in that moment. Well, uh, then Senator Biden, who was the youngest member of the U.S. Senate, if I was going to be elected, I'd be the second youngest at that time. Uh, he came up here for a 
you have to remember the Vermont Democratic Party was almost an asterisk at the time. He came up for a big rally the Vermont Democratic Party was going to have. I think 25 people were at it. And uh, he was then going off other states campaigning. The press talked about which candidates we had there for governor, this and that, and the other thing. Nice about uh, Joe Biden. I was, this is a few weeks before the election. I was irrelevant enough. I never even got mentioned. But Joe and I hit it off because we were laughing in the hallways. And he said, Boy, you get big crowds up here. I said, Oh, well, this is the last one. Last year I went to the crowd, it only had 15, we got almost 30 now. It's a point. I can see the acceleration. They looked at me like, Okay. <laughs> And then when I got elected, uh, the older members referred to the two of us as the kids, uh, because we were the two youngest. And I think we bonded over that, because neither one of us was supposed to have won the first time. And uh, you remember the headlines five days before the election, Paul Dooms Leahy, and then, which was an uncomfortable five days. <laughs> I saw myself the family after all this campaign. Then five days later, uh, Lee unexpectedly wins. <laughs> now, I should mention to everybody a little bit about Garrett. Uh, the Republican Party was having their celebrations here in Montpelier because they were going to elect the first a new senator in 34 years. Uh, senator Aiken had been elected for a four-year term, uh, first a completed term, the year I was born. And so now they're going to have a new one, so they're all over here to meet with a new one. It's only late into the evening, and things were looking a little bit different. And my uh, campaign in a hotel in, uh, or motel in, in uh, Burlington, the only press that came were young, aspiring uh, editors and writers from college newspapers, including Gary Graff. And My dad, Chris Graff. No, I, know, I thought you were there, too, from the college. No. <laughs> well, Chris, you've aged well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we had uh, the Vermont Civic and others. And I, I recommended they were taking pictures. Those were the pictures that were seen in the papers that had them the next day. I, I said, make sure if you took the pictures, you get paid for them. <laughs> so one of the things that really comes through in this book is how your closest and best political advisor in your entire career has been your wife. That's true. And. Um, Marcel shows up on uh, in almost every key moment in every key conversation, um, and uh, the the book is sort of filled with wonderful stories of, of the two of you, um, including uh, my favorite when you uh, went off after you got married, went off on your honeymoon, and returned to the family farm, and your father had printed up <laughs> one sign that said Patrick's room one sign that said Marcel's room, and then in between had posted signs saying no hunting or trespassing. Half of the way he passed. I wonder if you could sort of talk about um, how that relationship has inspired you and helped you through the course of your career, because I think it is so unique to me in American politics um, over the time that you two have been together serving the state. I can honestly say I could not have done it without Marcel. There are so many times very difficult issues that come up, whether run or not, the two of us could sit privately and just talk about it, knowing each other's thinking so well. I mean our decision to uh, uh, retire, uh, and that was before I had the accident, uh, was a joint decision. We, as you know, we picked the same room where I'd announced almost 48 years before for the election. But 
she could be very honest with me and say, you know, that was great, or what were you thinking? <laughs> and and, and then we're not, and then she is highly respected by other senators I'm with, uh, uh, presidents o over the years, others, and again, I find that they can seek out her advice and know it's not going to not going to be in the papers. It's going to be between them, and that's been very helpful. Uh, I sit here in Vermont every so often when I come to something. Oh, uh, good to see you. Where's Marcel? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit <laughs> about Patrick. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of your accomplishments in the Senate and some of the major moments that you have lived through. Um, and one of the things I also loved about the book was uh, you, you get so much of your sense of humor in it, and there's so many funny moments, um, both you and Marcel. Um, and, and I thought I would uh, um, share one, one of them uh, and, and then actually ask you about uh, a less funny moment in the, the wake of 9-11 and um, you, the anthrax scare uh, that, that targeted you, uh, which you talk a lot about, and sort of the, uh, the way that you sort of struggled with your conscience in the wake of 9-11 uh, uh, and the run-up to the Iraq war, uh, and how you were having dinner uh, with Bill Plant, the CBS bureau chief, uh, the week that your uh, office was targeted with anthrax. Um, Bill Plant, legendary CBS newsman, actually passed away this week himself. Um, and that you and Marcel came up with an idea that you were going to show up at his house for dinner wearing yellow rubber gloves. And you knocked on Bill's door and said, it's been a busy week. I haven't had all the chance to answer all my mail. Could I borrow your kitchen table to open the rest of it? <laughs> Um, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what it was like living through that moment and yeah. the anthrax scare and sort of the run-up to the Iraq war. Well, the anthrax scare was significant. Uh, fortunately, when the first anthrax letter hit and killed somebody in, in Florida, and then there was a rumor that one had arrived in one of the set office buildings, my chief of staff had stopped the bill coming into our, our uh, office. We found that a letter addressed to me, had, because the zip codes are very similar, went to the State Department by mistake. This was when I was supposed to receive it open. One of the postal employees who touched it, took it from here, and put it here, died as a result. Uh, others, people were targeted specifically. They died, and uh, when we found that one of the letters addressed to me had been found, this is a few weeks later, and all the mail they were holding, knowing that one container had something in it. Uh, it, it was frightening. I, I was on my way home, got a call from the FBI director, uh, Robert Barr. And he said, well, we've, we've found the fifth letter we're looking for. I said, oh, God, Bob, don't tell me. He said, yeah, it's addressed to you. And uh, you'll see police cars outside your home when you get there. We want you to have security. It was a very frightening moment. I mean, my other state's attorney, I even had, you know, I had people who threatening to kill me and all that. I never really worried about it. This one, I knew that the letter directed to me killed somebody else. And Bill Platt and Robin Smith had invited us over for dinner with some mutual friends before. And they, they thought, well, we, we have to cancel. And I, I said, I've got to get out of this sense of concern. That's when we came up with the idea. I said, no, we'll be there. And the police car brings us up, and we knock on the door. And, and Dave and all the others say, now, don't talk about the anthrax. It's going to be wrong. Pat and Marcel, something terrible. Don't talk about it. I should have put myself in the rubber in a place where we could sign this bill. Well, the, uh, 
the laughter grew and, and it happened to be out of the funk that I was in because of the uh, because of the attack. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about the decision to uh, vote against the Iraq War authorization, which you sort of really wrestle with in the book. Um, and there's this incredible story uh, to me, uh, as someone who covers national security, the, the most amazing story in the whole book of how you, you and Marcel were out walking a couple of uh, weekends and these two men, joggers. two joggers would come up to you and say, you really should ask for file number five yeah. and, uh, in your classified briefing. And then the next weekend they said, you really should ask, for, now that you've seen file five, you should really see file 12. Yeah. And that it was sort of, those were the secret files evidently that sort of showed that the Bush administration was stretching the intelligence that it made. I, I had asked a whole lot of questions in, in these meetings. Uh, and we see joggers in our neighborhood all the time. We'd never seen these two before. Again, uh, good morning, Senator. Good morning, Mrs. Leahy. I heard you had the briefing. I said, well, I can't talk about the briefing. I had it. But they show you a file. They use a code word. I yeah. put just a number in there. And when I saw it, it was contradicted what had been uh, uh, told us by Dick Cheney and others who had briefed us. And I was troubled by the first one that had said so. And that, then all of a sudden they appear again. But did you see the other file? And uh, I'm like, holy. <laughs> well, I couldn't talk about blah, blah, blah. I understand, but I think he's quite interesting. So he did. And I told myself, I'm going to come out against the war. Uh, I don't care how pop, popular going after the Iraqis, because you know, the New York Times and everything was pretty. They had this thing that they had weapons of mass destruction. Well, they didn't have. And, and the uh, evidence was very clear. So we were uh, out of walking again on a Sunday after church, and these big black cars go by, and one pulls up a suburban with kind of antennas I get used to now, and another one right behind it. The window goes down. It's a uh, member of President. Bush is in her circle, and he said, Pat, Marcel, good to see you. I said, well, good to see you. Pat, can I talk with you? Everybody gets out of the car. I get in. Windows go back up. It's a secure thing. And he said, I hear you. You read the two files, and you're going to vote against the war. I said, that's right. Uh, can I talk you out of that and vote for it? I said, no. He said, will we still be friends? I said, yes, but it's not right what you guys are saying. So I started to get out myself, walked out about a mile or so from her home. And he said, we'll give you a ride. I said, well, let me tell you where I live. The answer was, we know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. Uh, I would rather watch over myself at that point. Yeah. Um, and I voted against it. Several people afterward told me they, they finally read something and would vote for it for one reason or another. Wish they voted that way. One of my heroes in both Democratic and Republican administration, this is not in the, the book, but it was Colin Powell. Mm -hmm who talked, spoke to the UN and vouched for these weapons of mass destruction that he had been briefed on. And of course, it turned out there were none. And we ran to each other somewhere and I, we were talking about it. He uh, had known what I had been saying. He was now retired and became very ill and died. And he said the biggest, mis and we had talked about the illustrious career he had, a wonderful career. He said, my biggest mistake was that I didn't read the intelligence you read. Hmm. And even in his book, he, he talks about, uh, he wished he'd read that. Yeah. Um, your book is littered with incredible anecdotes of some of your colleagues from the Senate. Um, and 
one of the things that really stands out is that you had a very special friendship in the Senate and later um, in his White House with uh, Barack Obama. Um, and um, it, you, uh, um, you would tease each other in, uh, a lot. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your, your friendship with Barack Obama and sort of how, um, how you sort of uh, encouraged him along on his presidential run. Well, he, uh, uh, you know, he was doing, he sort of, in many ways, kept to himself. But the two of us would work out in the Senate gym. He's an ad. He was in far better shape than I was. And, and, and uh, he would tease me about my old sneakers. We would trash talk each other, something fierce. And on the way out, we'd be laughing our heads off with our arms around each other. But I encouraged him to run. He, he had taken a money for a governor uh, in uh, Illinois. And I said, look, you have a chance to run. Run. Uh, so what if you lose? The way I thought is a lot of different than Senator in Vermont, uh, but no, the only state in the union never elected a Democrat, and we're the 14th state in the union. If I hadn't run that time, I would have regretted it forever. Mm -hmm. And just do it. Uh, you have the backing. And he then announced he, he would. Uh, I had friends that they were running, including uh, Hillary Clinton, and she had won decisively the first primary in New Hampshire. Marcel and I liked to scuba dive, and we were, it was a week's break in the Senate, we were down in the Caribbean diving, and I called Barack on his uh, cell phone, and I said, look, I want to come out for you and I'll go anywhere, endorse you and everything else. He said, well, you know I lost. I said, yeah, we, there's one TV cell in the island where I would watch that. And so then he says, uh, remember it was John McCain who was going to be running against him. He gets Marcel on the phone, but this is where we were. He said, I, it's great that Patrick's going to come out for me, but if you're down there diving and all in the Caribbean, tell him to put a hat on when he comes up so he doesn't uh, burn that bald head of his. He was on speaker, I could hear it. I said, you know, I was just thinking, do you happen to have John McCain's phone number? We got a lot of calls. But we had that kind of relationship. And of course, two days later, in a southern state, I made a, a strong endorsement of him, uh, as did others. And, you know, I've always, we, we've always teased each other, but then we've had very serious conversations. And I thought the, the world about him. I, um, well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I've got three more questions that I want to ask, and then we're going to take a couple of audience questions. Um, so if you want to start thinking about any questions you might have for the senator. You know, here in Vermont, we think of you, uh, Senator Leahy, as um, you know, for your role on the Agriculture Committee, your uh, you know the uh, decades that you served on the Judiciary Committee and uh, on the Appropriations Committee. But uh, throughout the book, some of your sort of biggest and proudest achievements come in foreign policy, um, and uh, in, in terms of relations with Cuba. Um, and your role sort of reopening the, or the relations with, with Cuba uh, in terms of banning landmines and, of course, the Leahy Law. Um, it, it, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the foreign policy realm that we don't really think of as much uh, here, at least as part of your legacy, but that I think is probably the biggest stamp you have put on the world. Well, in some ways, uh, the fact that I don't go rushing off and hold a press conference and everything I might do uh, overseas because I found that if you do it quietly, you get the confidence of the people you're working with. And, uh, you know, I, Vietnam has always bothered me. I'm the only uh, Vermonter to vote to end the war. And at that time, the uh, editor of our largest newspaper told me I'd never get reelected because he strongly supported the war. 
but I felt comfortable with it. And I felt, why be in the Senate if you can't do something? Now later, uh, having seen a young child during uh, the conflicts in Central America uh, in a field hospital without, with a leg missing, and he was, he was devastated for the rest of his life. It turned out it was landmines, so I started learning more about landmines. And Bobby Buller, who had, was paralyzed as a Marine in Vietnam, but began the Viet, uh, uh, Vietnam veterans uh, for, for Vietnam, John McCain, John Kerry, who had tried to open that. I thought, well, maybe we could use the Leahy War Victims Fund for that. I talked to the funny story I probably should put in there. Uh, President Bush and Jim Baker was secretary, and I was in the Oval Office, and I was saying, you know, we, we could do this, we could run the money through the Vietnam veterans, and the President said, that's a great idea. Baker was Secretary of State said, that's a great idea. And I said, well, you got an assistant secretary so and so thinks it's a lousy idea. President Bush says, Jimmy, I didn't know you were called Jimmy. Jimmy, get him on the phone. So he gets him on the phone, and the guy earnestly explains to the secretary why he thinks it's a lousy idea. He said, okay, look, I got somebody here who thinks it's a great idea, Mr. President. Did you hear it? <laughs> and therefore, it went over. And I'll never forget the effect. Here's all these people who lost their legs. They would crawled on the ground for, for years. They gave me their first wheelchair under the lay fund. And they asked me to pick up this man, put him in the wheelchair. All the, through the speech, and he's staring at me. I was thinking, this guy must hate me. Uh, American, over six feet tall. I'm walking in and out. Uh, they asked me to pick him up, put him in his wheelchair. I did. I put him in the wheelchair. He grabbed my shirt and pulled me down and kissed me. The same thing happened to John Glenn. When he put that, and John was not, the rest of his soul was not an emotional type. He had tears in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And he was moved by it and became one of my strongest supporters. And when I told the president about it, he had tears. But the thing is, I said, okay, this is one step. Let's keep doing it. Went to uh, get rid of Agent Harms and Dene. Uh, John Tracy, who was the head of my Vermont office, been stationed in Dene as a gun on a, a helicopter and fought against the Vietnamese. He came with me. I explained to the top general in uh, Vietnam who John Tracy was. The general stands up. Of course, everybody else stands up because he was so respected. He walks down to where John was, stands at attention, saluted him. That uh, kind of told what happened. We've done this step by step. I'm going to Vietnam. I hope uh, later this month, and but it's all just done step by step, mm -hmm. and then they would come away, and then we'd come away. It doesn't mean we agree on everything with them by any means, but it happened. Cuba was the same way. Uh, the first time we went down there, Jack Reed, the senator from Rhode Island, was about five foot eight, I think. Speaks uh, been a paratrooper speaks Spanish, and we, as we thought might happen, we got called in the middle of the night to go and have dinner with Fidel Castro. And I had interrupted him. Suddenly he said, to "Everybody, look, you don't interrupt him." And I said, "Well, you should know about Senator Reed. Uh, he's been traveling with me." And Jack, tell the President what you said about me. So he says in Spanish, uh, places where we'd go, I'd speak and he said, be nice to the big guy because he thinks he's important, but I'm the guy you got to talk with. <laughs> for now, I says, do you know what he said? I go, oh, yeah, we do this routine. All over. But he loved it. I mean, nobody would ever do that with him. We were back and forth and back and forth. and. Uh, he wanted Marcel to know that they make the finest ice cream in the world there. I said, well, no, no, no. We got Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> he said, never heard of it. 
I said, would you want some? He said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. On the way out, he grabs my son's arm. He said, if he sends the ice cream, pack it and dry ice. <laughs> and we did. Uh, the <coughs> Secretary of State, which you heard about, of course, Bill Cole is ready to charter a plane, go down and talk about the revolution with uh, Fidel. But they ended up, we, we got it down there and got a very nice note back from him and, and a box, which I was hoping wouldn't be, would not be cigars, but it's all, every kind of rum they make is still sitting, rum sitting unopened with a handwritten note from uh, Fidel was there. But, I say that as just a precursor when Raul Castro became uh, president. He would not meet with any American officials. I had a delegation of Republicans and Democrats down there. Asked, uh, I got a phone call at lunch. It was Castro. He'd like to meet with me that evening. And, um, which was a surprise, but I asked him so I could bring myself. I said, okay. I said, well, I've got a delegation of senators. I don't want to see a delegation. Well, could I bring the senior Republican who's on it to show us bipartisan? All right. We go to the meeting, and here's the kind of inner diplomacy. I said, well, you know, you uh, people of our age, he said, I'm over in New York. I said, okay, I'm doing really good as a diplomat. And uh, I said, but we'll remember what you did wrong. You remember what you think we did wrong. You're a bigger country. You, are. you did more things wrong than we did. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, I'm really doing a good job here. <laughs> and I said, well, we have, uh, we, you know, we want to leave a better world for our children and grandchildren. I have a great granddaughter. Marcel said, oh, do you have a picture of her? <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> they didn't seem lovely. And uh, we have a, a, a granddaughter of the same age, and uh, uh, he pointed out that his grandson's head of security is white, uh, mother is black, and so well, our granddaughter is just the opposite. Our daughter is white, our son-in-law is African-American. Bring pictures the next time you come. And then Dick Shelby, conservative, that was his wife, uh, Dr. Shelby, she said, well, you know, I taught a number of Cuban students at Georgetown where she was a professor. The whole attitude changed. And we kept in touch. And then I, I, I wanted to get a uh, prisoner they, they had. And we, I talked about that in the book. And what we didn't talk about was they also had a CIA agent who had been held prison for a number of years, and we finally worked out an exchange. Uh, I went down in one plane to, with the wife of the American. Uh, another plane took three Cubans we had in prison down, and a third plane, unmarked plane. We all went to different airports. Uh, went to pick up the CIA on the ground. I think 35 minutes, uh, President Obama said our son was one of his photographers down there. And it was an emotional thing. And then that led to um, President Obama being the first president, I, I believe, to go to Cuba since Calvin Coolidge. And things improved so much for that. I regret terribly, I told him so at the time, when Donald Trump cut off all the things we had worked for decades to agree with Cuba. Uh, it didn't help us. It damaged the uh, young people in Cuba. And, uh, but, yeah. um, but, but those, uh, the, the Cuba, the Vietnam, and passing, uh, we were the first country to ban the export of landmines. There's a law I wrote. Other countries, then dozens of them, copied the same law. Many of them call it the Leahy Law. And the last thing, we set the uh, Leahy Law. In fact, I was on the phone half the weekend and, and parts of this. Uh, it bans 
our aid going to any military unit in the world is clear violation of human rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me ask one final question here um, about the Supreme Court. Um, you are one of the four U.S. senators uh, sitting in the Senate right now who has voted on the entire Supreme Court uh, over the course of your career. Um, and uh, not, not for all of them. <laughs> I, didn't for, I didn't say vote, voted for all of them. Voted on all of them. Um, and you talk about, and it's really striking in the book, the sort of arc of the politicization of court nominations. And you, you talk about uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's nomination as one of your proudest moments as a senator. Um, you talk about how uh, you voted for uh, John Roberts when he was Chief Justice and sort of what an important moment that was for you in terms of the sort of regular order of Supreme Court nominations. Um, and, and then you have actually some very strong words um, for Mitch McConnell in the book about uh, the Merrick Garland nomination and the death of Antonin Scalia. Um, and I wonder if you could just sort of, as a final question tonight, um, talk a little bit about the challenge of the way that the court has become politicized and, and what that has done to the Senate as an institution. Well, that, that worries, what has happened worries me very much. It was back and forth on my mind on John Roberts. I did not want somebody as Chief Justice to be there in a party line vote uh, because I wanted to see, I, I, I wanted to keep some respect for the court, even though he and I disagree with some issues, but I thought he's an honest, well-qualified person. But then it all started to unravel with Merrick Garland, a man that uh, it was a, on the Court of Appeals, a number of Republicans that said, that's the sort of person Barack Obama, is moderate, uh, should appoint. Uh, well, as soon as he nominated him, Mitch McConnell said, well, we never confirmed somebody in a presidential election year, which of course is BS, that's a technical parliamentary term. We, uh, uh, <laughs> kind of like, I mean, like, don't you use the word. <laughs> but, uh, but we had uh, Anthony Kennedy was in Ronald Reagan's last year of his time, it's going to be an election, which actually uh, is going to be an election that, that fall. And Democratic controlled con Congress and Senate. We confirmed Kennedy like 92 or something in votes. And so it was a complete uh, misstatement that McConnell was saying. And I told him so. But it opened the way then to have people come in that the Federalist Society had been grooming that had very clear uh, ideas of how they would vote and made it very clear to the Federalist Society. And I had concerned anyway by some who sat on the bench like Alito would go to, to political gatherings, which justices never did and talked about the need for uh, politicized the uh, court and then uh, attacking Joe Biden and others. Uh, it, the whole thing fell apart that mm -hmm. uh, during the Trump years when they came in and they were willing, to, uh, McConnell claims so much for the rules, they waived the rules on timing, on the amount of hearings they have, the White House blocked part of the uh, uh, background uh, checks, including for one judge who was having, or nominee who was having enough trouble because a, a woman who had said what he'd done wrong. And I said, yeah, but I also want you to look at the fact that he accepted 
stolen files from the Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee, stolen by a guy named Miranda. Mm -hmm. And it just, the politicization started then, it continued with the Federalists and others basically grooming people and saying they, they will take over the courts. Uh, it's such a mistake. Yeah. And uh, I'm afraid that the respect that I always had as a young lawyer, and I argued before all the federal courts and state courts, it destroys the respect people have for their decisions. I mean, I always felt as a prosecutor, I argued a lot of cases of Vermont Supreme Court. I would accept whatever they did. Uh, in fact, the case we kind of engineered to get up there, Beecham versus Leahy, this would be for Roe versus Wade. And I'd argued why uh, the law against abortion in Vermont was unconstitutional. Five member conservative Supreme Court in Vermont agreed with me on that. And before Roe versus Wade, they came down with a decision here in Vermont in uh, the Beach of Leahy mm -hmm. that, out, that outlawed restraints and left it up to a, a woman and her physician to make the decision. I'm proud of that. Yeah. All right, I think we've got time for a question or two from the audience. Yeah, and the player is going to steal my microphone away and take it out into the audience. Yeah, we have time for a few questions, and then we'll do um, book signings and um, both of the gentlemen will be signing us. And we'll ask for the book signing. We're going to ask people to come up on the stage so that those stairs there, and uh, we'll sign right there. It could I also say I, I have Karen Kraft's latest book of Watergate, which is excellent, signed. Also and I have a signed copy of the road taken. Oh, thank you, sir. To you. <laughs> I have to, right after he asked the questions, you know, it's not to influence him. <laughs> Anybody want to ask a question? Craig Salt. I'm Hello, Senator Kerry. I'm Craig Line, and it was maybe 1987 or 88. I was working as a stringer for Associated Press. And I was given the assignment to drive to Burlington to your office where I was to take photographs of you explaining why and how you had released a, a confidential report to an NBC report. And I felt horrible having to do that. And, and you, to your credit, you came to Vermont. You gave reporters their fair chance to have at you. And that night, I was having dinner with friends, and we all said, but aren't we lucky? And the next day, I said, my God, I'm going to call him up and tell him that. So I looked up your number in the phone book. You remember what that is, right? And I called, and Marcel, you answered the phone, and said, oh, thank you so much. It's been a hard week. And Pat's not here. He went down to the hardware store. An hour later, you called Craig. It's Pat, like we are old friends. And we were both photographers. Well, it is indeed. Um, and what struck me then, and what has struck me ever since, and, and this is not just true of you, but of many Vermont politicians, we are so lucky to have people who are authentic and real and really thinking not of themselves so much, but of the rest of us and what's best. So uh, my comment is thank you so much for that. And how do you follow this up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, as Craig knows, I admire his uh, photographic skills. We usually talk about photography, you know, what lens you use on this. I should point out that, that I was angry at myself for releasing that confidential 
report, there's nothing classified in it. In fact, the committee released the whole, uh, not just the part I showed, released the whole uh, report within a week or so after pointing out that it's nothing classified because uh, as President Pro Tem and because of the committees I've chaired, I receive classified material uh, every week, sometimes every day. And, but, uh, you know, that's just what I have. We, we have always had a listed home phone number. I, once that somebody said, oh, I called so-and-so and so-and-so, and they're in Montpelier, and they're trying to reach me that back when you had phones and phone books. So he said, I called, he's dropping every kind of name of the famous people he called. And I got your phone number. I said, did you look at the phone book? No, you wouldn't be there. I said, look at the phone book. <laughs> Damn, it's there. <laughs> but darn, for those who are phone <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator, for the work you've done for Vermont, for our country, for the world. Uh, it's very impressive to hear it. I have the book. I can't wait to read it. Now, two things. The anthrax side of Where was that coming from? Who was sending anthrax to your office? to target you? That's the first question. The second question is, these two anonymous jobbers who gave you tips about the files, do you know who they were and or where they came from yeah. uh, to, to give you that information? That was so important. Thank you. No, I don't know their names. Uh, I surmise in my own mind where they may have come from. Obviously, somebody in the administration uh, knew that uh, all senators were getting bad information. And, uh, and they knew that I'd work carefully on these issues and I think they want me to to know. On the anthrax, uh, a long, long time was spent trying to figure out who did it and why. The FBI stated basically emphatically that they had the right man they've been telling. Turned out they had the wrong person. He lost his job, sued the FBI and they had to cough up a million or two million dollars. Then they, the New York Times was writing that there was weapons of mass destruction. Their reporter uh, had a special source, a guy named Chalvey. The people in the intelligence referred to him as curveball. But they did not trust him. And in the anthrax thing, uh, the man they finally had a warrant for committed suicide just before they arrested him, and they closed the uh, case. They said, you must be satisfied now we have the right person. I said, you don't. You may have had the person who mailed the anthrax, but it was such a complicated type of anthrax. There had to be others involved. And I've, I've told them my suspicions of who they are. And uh, uh, that would always bother me why they didn't. People died. They tested on one young woman uh, in New York and killed her. Uh, a woman nearly 90 years old in Connecticut died because her male had touched some of the mail sent to, to me and Tom Dasher. And I think there were several people involved with that. And I think that the, it was not a good investigation. And these are my own personal views. And I'd like to know why I was targeted. Uh, two of us were 
in the uh, Senate, myself and Tom Daschle. for a new James Bond. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if I could just fit in the Aston Martin, but uh, uh, I've been in you know, five Batman movies, and I've written some things for Batman. And I used to add every single set that I've made in those Batman movies, and it's been a fair amount, goes to the Kellogg Hubbard Children's Library. And, My first library card there when I was four, my sister and I, and our brother John would be there and read all kinds of books that our parents encouraged us to read. I want young people to learn how to read. Between the money from that and all the money I was able to get from, uh, from some of the actors and others, they were able to build the big wing took the library out of the basement, as I see Ed shaking it, out of the basement, made the, the wing, which is designed to, for children who read way above their level, they have that, but those children who have a hard time reading, they have that. And it's just, I love it. In fact, I'll try to make it very short. I, I uh, was volunteered one time on a Saturday uh, I'm reading her and I'm reading the story and I was handed a note that Batman's enemies had hidden their uh, pictures in the library and had clues which I couldn't figure out. I grabbed my cell phone. I said, are you nearby? I need help. Door opens the inbox Batman. Now you got four or five or six year old kids I like this. Batman couldn't decipher the clues. The children did. So on the way out he goes, I want to thank you, children. You're welcome, Mr. Batman. That was worth it all. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. There was a passage in the book that you talked about um, uh, the sort of fight over organic farming labeling, mm -hmm. where you had this great passage about Vermont that. We're a small state. We've never even tried to be the biggest at anything. But we've excelled by being the best in a quiet kind of show, don't tell way. We took our, that quiet pride in everything from our maple syrup to our granite and marble to our cheddar cheese. If it had the word Vermont in front of it, it meant something about quality and craftsmanship. So, Senator, I wanted to thank you for being the best kind of Vermont senator that we could ever ask for. Thank you.